Hey, hey, GM, GM. What's up, Chad? What's up, Thor Chads? How's it going, guys? What's going on, man? Anything, anything new? Anything new? Anything new? There's always new stuff. There's always new stuff. Um, I don't know. What do you want to talk about first? Um, we can hop into it in a minute. We could just uh, let's see. I, I've been working on a, a couple pairs of shoes. I, I haven't done any any Thor forces in a while, but uh, finally shipping out a couple pairs. Dude, I, I love those Thor forces. Yeah, man. I. I I, I, yeah, I, I went to a, like, I moved a, while, a little while back. So like, I don't have my whole sneaker workshop set up anymore. So, uh, this is probably my last, my last ones for a while. I had some outstanding, uh, orders I had to get shipped out, but now, now I'm in the clear. Yeah. 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 That's awesome, man. Appreciate that. It's cool. I, like, I, I, honestly, like it, it's pretty crazy knowing how many like countries and stuff like uh, i've shipped these to just like you know all across the u.s been i you know over like a dozen countries i'm pretty sure shipped to like every every corner of the globe it's uh, kind of crazy i mean i just do you still sell them like if somebody wanted to buy a pair of air uh Thor force ones for me would you would you make them and set, ship them uh i i do but i well it's, it's a lot harder for me now that i don't have like a dedicated like area to to do it in so yeah. i'm trying to trying to ramp it down which which i have been doing over like the last the last like year or so i've done a couple orders but um you know nothing not not nothing too much i would do it if if uh if some big thor chads want it done then i do it but the, the wait time is a lot longer than it used to be <laughs> you just you just got to get some like some slave labor out of taiwan to be pumping this shit out that's what you got to be doing I don't know if the market's that big to, you know, start <laughs> contracting people like that. Yeah. Yeah, but then also you could do, instead of Thor Force ones, you could do like flip, chain flip Force ones or something. Uh, yeah, I think that's an even more niche market that <laughs> has yet to be tapped yet. Maybe yeah. I'll, uh, I'll talk to them and see if they're doing that. But, um, yeah, you could. I mean, there's going to be other cool projects. Run. There's going to be some other cool Thor train merch that's definitely going to have to happen. I mean, one thing I've I've like really wanted to do for like a couple years now is the uh, the, the Thor Rolex. I think that's going to have to be a thing. Uh, maybe like this year, or next year, or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think someone Thor Rolex. a couple years back, like photo sh- the. So, so a couple years back, someone I saw like a, th- a photoshopped like like Submariner, but the dial is like you know like a black dial that says like uh, you know Thor chain on it and like a the gradient Thor chain color as God. the bezel, and I was like, ooh, that's like that's super nice. I'd, and I, I'd I, I don't think it would actually day. be a Rolex, but I would. Well, I know you would. I would wear that. <laughs> that's why. That's why I'm making it. Dude, to sell it to you. Yeah, I'll, I'll buy it. I'll buy it. I'll buy it. <laughs> No, we'll see if it's actually a uh, I, like. I, I don't think it'd be a Rolex because you you could do custom face. I've looked I've, I've looked into this actually, and um, you can do custom faces and stuff. But like people who like really collect watches, they don't really like custom faces. Um, I, like Dorchats would like that. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it, it kind of kind of ruins the uh, like the right you know collector value of it. But it would be like you know. Like it'd be super niche, so maybe it's a better idea just to make like a custom like Thor chain watch or something. No, like it would that. definitely be super niche for sure. Like I've seen, like uh, I saw a while back um, that uh, Ed Sheeran made a bunch of like custom. Wa- He's like a big watch guy, and him and like John Mayer are like just big watch people. Yeah, yeah. And they he made like a a, a tour watch for his like for his people that they went on this tour for like one of his tours. I don't know which one it was. Um, and so he just made like a bunch of watches. I can't remember if it was a Rolex or like what, but it was just like, it was pretty cool. It actually looked, looked, looked really good. And, and like all those people he gave the watches to, like they all like absolutely love that watch. But like, you know, it makes sense for that case in that scenario, but they're not, no, you know, no one's going to, you know. Like, yeah, exactly. There's no like, there's no market. For there's that. no market. There's no market like for a collector it. or like, yeah, yeah. Like there's, there's people like enthusiasts of Thor Chain. Like that's, that's all, like would, would certainly be a pretty cool thing. So I'm, I'm passively looking into that. I'm not like, I'm just too busy with all the other like you know BD stuff and whatever to like really you know get get focused on that. But I think it's a cool idea for something in the future. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm. If you do it, let me know. I'd be I'd be very interested. I'm a, I'm an interested party. <laughs> I, I, I figured. <laughs> um, I also I also got some cool like some cool stickers made for East Denver. So if people are going out to East Denver, then I have some special 
uh, door chain stickers oh, yeah. that are, are going to be there. Uh, I don't I, I, no one, no one's seen them yet, so they're, they're pretty dope, though. I, I will, I will Dude, say. I'm excited for maybe, that. Maybe something I've been working on in, in secret for a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, in, it, for anybody cool. listening in the ethos there, uh, myself and, and Kyle will be there. Uh, I think a lot of the Nine Realms people will be there. Like, it's going to be a pretty uh, – we're going to have a lot of presence there, to be honest. Um, and we're going to have a throw a party as well. If anybody wants to come out to our, our Thor chain party, we're, we're co-doing with uh, Coinage Media with uh, Zach Guzman or uh, Zach Guz, God, Guz, uh, pronounce it. Um, and so, yes, we're doing, I think we're still working on the details of when and where, but, but anyway, if anybody's going to be at East Denver, you should definitely hang out with us. Yeah, probably going to be on the 2nd of March, 2024. So on that Saturday, probably at night somewhere, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to throw something cool for the, for the community. We did, we did one last year. Honestly, we went to East Denver last year and the event is, is pretty great. So like just, there's so many, like there's so many builders there that there, there's just like a lot of good people yeah. to talk to. And then just like enthusiasts too. And we, we had a Thor chain meetup last year. Yep. And it was a ton of fun, like seeing people, there's a ton of shape shift uh, people out there yep. and just like, you know, people from the Thor chain community. And then just like the surrounding community, like some, some pretty like OG, like Dogecoin uh, people, uh, you know, just like everyone. It, it's a really cool event. I, I really liked it last year. So that's why we're, right. we're definitely going to, uh, make a presence this year it was a ton of fun to this day my personal favorite east denver party out of all the parties we went to at all the east denvers was the first store chain party we threw it was at this like place that had like uh ping pong tables and it was like a huge like like a, so many people came out some people flew out from like austin texas or something like this just to go to this party and it was really awesome because you could you could drink you get some food play some ping pong and it was like it wasn't like overtly loud like one of my pet peeves at these like you know events and parties at like East denver is that it's just like these these bars and it's just fucking loud as shit and you just really just can't have an actual conversation it's like really hard to like really just like really good you know back and forth between you and whoever you're talking to but i that party we threw was fucking awesome i love that one yeah, yeah, I heard that was like that was two years ago. I think yeah. I, I wasn't there, but I heard that was that was super cool. And I totally agree. Like the same, like I I hate that too. When you go to like when you're trying to like talk to people and the music is just so loud, it's like all right, like right, but that's, <laughs> it, it, it needs to calm down. That's the like, point of the fucking is good, party but, is to talk to people. It's yeah. not there to like listen to music and and drink beer because you can do that anywhere yeah, yeah. anywhere in the fucking world right exactly. the whole point of it is to go there and meet people and talk and like connect and on telegram or fucking whatever and like it just becomes such a pain in the ass because this is some dj that's like loud as shit you know pumping loud music and you just can't even engage with anybody and have a really good conversation because it's like you you can have really great conversations where you talk about economics, right? Or talk about like token design, talk about, you know, whatever, but you, that requires, you know, intricate, compl like complicated conversation. It's just hard to do that in those scenarios. Yeah. So we're going to definitely have like a bunch of builders, like come out, you know, people from, you know, wallets for other protocols and just like, you know, people that are in the, uh, in the surrounding space, not necessarily like integrated with the chain, but you know, there's definitely going to be, uh, you know, a big, big presence there. Um, you know, we're not doing anything like at the event itself, like like sponsoring right. or anything. But uh, it, it's a great, it's a great time to, to like come out. I'm pretty, and you can go for free. Actually, uh, you don't need to pay anything to go to East Denver. You just need to sign up for their DAO, and it, that's free too. So you can just sign up for their DAO and just go. Yeah, that's right. I think I think they only allow like the first twenty five thousand is, is for that. I think. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you got to be early then, you I guess. Be early, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's still there. I, I, I have no idea. Though, so. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I'm not sure. Actually, my my sister's going to be there too because she just got her her first job in crypto. <laughs> she. Oh really? Yeah, she's worked. She's uh well actually she's in negotiations. I should probably shouldn't say this publicly, but okay, okay. she's in negotiations with her first job in crypto, and and you know it, it, they're trying to work out the details and whatnot, but. She'll be there, and we'll be hanging out, which will be fun too. Awesome! Well, congrats. Yeah, yeah it's a, it's a perfect time to meet like builders in the, in the space, especially because like it, it's just a event where everyone can kind of make it out, especially like US US people, but people come from from all over too. Uh, later later this year, I was kind of thinking about uh, Token Twenty Forty Nine in in uh, Singapore. That's in September. 
because uh, you know th- there's just such a big like crypto hub down there in uh in singapore i've, I've just been thinking and that's like probably uh in, in last year um so many projects are reaching out like hey you guys are you know in singapore this week singapore this week and i was like damn like should have made the time to go out so i'm, I'm feeling like uh Later in this year, uh, Token 2049 in Singapore would be a good place to go to. Yeah, that's a good conference. I've, I've, I've been there once or twice. You know, I've, I've speak on a panel there or whatever, but it's a really good – it's really a high-quality conference. Like they run it pretty well. Cool, man. Uh, let's let's jump into it then. What do, you, uh, what do you want to talk about? What we got going on? Uh I guess we can start with any updates on just like some of the instability stuff, like uh, like Doge and and that kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, Doge was, was um, a pain in the neck, and the reason why is because, if I understand correctly, and I hope I hope that I do, but um, people started blasting Doge, and the mempool like got exploded out, and it, I think it's still I think it's still pretty crazy now. Um, I can find it. Uh, here it is. Yeah, it's still massive right now, and I think it's because people are using Doge for inscriptions, kind of like how people were using for for Bitcoin initially, and they were just, and that just kind of abuses the mempool in some in some way, shape, or form. I think that's primarily why. And then the other issue is that the the Doge daemon itself is a little bit uh, kind of outdated. From like the from the Bitcoin daemon, like it doesn't have like the performance improvements, and so there are like there are some improvements made to the UTXO chain, specifically Bitcoin, and a couple other ones. Where if you want to like just look at all the items in the mempool, it's fairly fast and efficient. Whereas the older version, the one that Doge is not operating on, is not so efficient. And so like nodes had a hard time just like keeping up with the mempool. It was just causing things to kind of fall behind. We had had to pause trading temporarily for. In order for the network to recover, but we've made some changes, and and, to, and I think there was like the master branch or the you know the, the dev branch of Doge had some some V two changes that would make it more performant, which nodes kind of like pulled that down and started to get back up to the tip again, which we're we're now we're now live again. But in this particular case, it wasn't even a problem because of us. It was really a problem because of performance issues on Doge combined with inscriptions kind of abusing the system the UTXO system in some sense. It was just kind of a funny thing. Yeah. And it also looks like the Doge people are going to be updating uh, Dogecoin core to make it simpler for wallets and things to uh, query with, you know, giant inscription, um, you know, pools going on, on, on Dogecoin. So they're actually, they're pulling in some changes to, to make it simpler for, you know, not only for ThorChain, but for all their wallets and DEXs and, you know, people that need to <clears throat> be looking at block data in, in real time. So hopefully that should make things just easier for everybody. But trading's back up now, so yep. you can go trade Doge, do whatever. This is one of the funny okay. things about doing things in a centralized way versus decentralized way that a, a, a sex, like, you know, like a Coinbase or whatever, can deal with this problem just by brute force, right? They can just spin up, you know, a bunch of different Doge daemons and blah, 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 and, and query them all simultaneously and kind of um, what's called um, horizontal scaling in, in, in tech speak. You can just do that. It's fine. But uh, because you have the economies of scale happening in your benefit in a centralized scenario. But decentralization in general goes against the economies of scale. It's like the inverse of the economies of scale. And so it just becomes more complicated or more difficult or more expensive because instead of, you know, spinning another Doge daemon or whatever it is, theoretically, everybody would have to spin up another Doge daemon. Each node operator has to spin up two or whatever, right, theoretically. It's more, com- it's more complicated than that because of, like, how the mempool is replicated, blah, 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 and the gossip behind it all but at a high level the things you can do to to kind of like scale it ver- uh, horizontally but like we really can't do that I mean, we can but like nothing stopping us necessarily but like it just becomes overtly expensive because we have to spin up lots of more doge daemons versus coin to spin up one right right like a sex could have 10 doge daemons and one's just scanning block one the other one's scanning block two you know up to up to 10 and then it's just it's just bashing that the, the entire way mm. basically where you have you have one daemon that's just scanning each block so you don't have to scan each one individually like in, in sequence 
Yeah, there's, there's, there's ways you can kind of like thread things, meaning that you just create different yeah. channels where you can use, you know, to for horizontal kind of like or sharding, another you know, word you can use in this context. But like, it just, it just, we, we can't do that. And we can do it, there's nothing stopping us, but like, it's, it's just not as applicable for us. And so we have to figure, find more efficient methodology of, deal, of, of dealing with this, this kind of stuff than, than Coinbase does. Because they can just brute force it. Whenever they reach a problem, in this kind of context, in this kind of way, they can just throw money at the problem and be done with it. Yep, makes sense. Cool, so that, that wraps it up for the, the production issues. Um, next, so on the next update, I think we're getting trade assets. So I don't think we've actually, we, we've talked about it a little bit on here, but we should go into trade assets again um, and just make sure that people understand like, you know, what, what trade assets are and like how to use them and what they're going to be good for and uh, just everything about trade accounts and, and trade assets. Are, are, are we, so the assets themselves are called trade assets and then using trade assets, that's called uh, trade accounts or um, yeah, what's the terminology? I guess here? that's the terminology. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm amendable to, to a change if people have better ideas, better suggestions, but you have to create an account, so to speak, which is basically just having a, a Thor address. It's not really creating an account per se, it's just having a Thor address. Um, and then you can deposit, you know, Bitcoin into that, into your wallet, so to speak. But it doesn't, but it doesn't actually, like, that's the thing is that, like, trade assets are not actually, technically, they're not actually tokens. They're not actually coins. It's just accounting internally within the Thorchain system. So it's like, if you put a trade asset into your wallet and you go look at your wallet, there will be nothing there, Right. Like it won't it won't show up in your wallet in a traditional sense. It's not really designed for, for like to be used as a general token to be you know transferred in that kind of way. Um, so you have the trade assets, which basically is just like a one to one representation of Bitcoin, ETH, and whatever. Um, well, technically, it's actually not one to one. Technically, like most of the time, it's one to one. But there are scenarios where where it can change. But like. Those are there just to create uh, more efficient assets for uh, primarily for arbitrage, so that arbitrage bots can arbitrage the network much more efficiently, which is good. Yeah, so so they're held by the network, so they're native assets that are held by the network, and but they're outside of the pool, right? So they're you know it, it's Bitcoin that Thorchain holds, but is not in the liquidity pool. So like, it's kind of a shift in in the paradigm where Thorchain is starting to custody assets that are not all in all in the pool, which I guess technically it does already with, with like, you know, inbound assets and like and outbound assets that are, you know, kind of outside the pool, like accounting wise, but it's still held by the vault. But this is just like an expansion of that concept where mm -hmm. not everything that's in the vault is, in uh, the pool. is in the pool. So it's like a assets that are outside the pool. And then there's a, you know, a, would you consider it a wrapped asset? Like it, it's, it definitely seems like you'd, consider this a wrapped asset. I know we, you don't consider synthetics to be wrapped because uh, it is a different like accounting model, but it does seem more like a, uh, well, like a wrapped asset where it's just, it's just held one to one. No, I mean, it's, it's not a wrapped asset because, um, because it's not a token that you hold in your wallet. You can't just arbitrarily transfer it. It's either, either you, you mint it or you, you burn it one, one or the other. You can't just like move it to some smart contract somewhere else or whatever it is. In addition to that, like, all of those kind of that accounting is just it's just held by the protocol itself rather than you as an individual and generally speaking it's it's held to like a one to one ratio but that can change and shift in the scenarios where the security of the network is less than the value of the assets in the in the vaults right the value of the rune the, the bonded rune is less than the value of the um, assets in the vaults and then what the network starts to do is creates like a negative interest rate Right. So like you're 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 depositing kind of like uh, it's kind of like uh, you're depositing uh, uh, not even tokens, but you're depositing tokens into this kind of like pool. Right. Of, of everything where everybody's holding their things and then you own a percentage of that pool. You own some amount of it kind of like kind of like being an LP, so to speak. But there's no swaps or income or any, any kind of happening. And there's no second asset. It's only just one asset things. And in a scenario where there gets, it starts to get too much assets and not enough security, 
the network will start kind of charging like a negative interest rate. So now like the units that you have that represents, you know, maybe you just let's say you have ten percent of the Bitcoin and of the trade trade assets, Bitcoin, whatever. Then you're gonna start, you know, instead of having ten percent, well, you're always gonna have ten percent technically because the whole thing is minus. But the the number of BDC will will start to decrease at that point in a, in a negative interest rate. Now that that interest rate is like very weak uh, and purposely because it's not there to like punish people. Like if we if we get undersecured and we have too much assets, that's actually not really a problem. Like in the in in, in the short term, like nobody's gonna you know you can't if you wanted to cyber attack the network, it would take months. Like maybe nine months, 10 months, something maybe even greater, depending upon some scenarios. But like, it would just take an exceeding a long time to get there if you, if you even wanted to do it, even if you had the capital. So, but it, it starts to create like a, just a small negative interest, which will trigger, you know, people who are holding those assets to like exit because you don't want to, you know, lose your Bitcoin, obviously. So you start to exit and the act of exiting uh, makes the network, the value of the assets less than the value of the security of the world. The, the bonded room so it's not a, it's not a wrapped asset because when you when you create this you know uh this token and this kind of accounting in the network you're not guaranteed that it's one to one you're not guaranteed that you put one bitcoin in you're going to get one bitcoin out tomorrow there's a scenario where that could be you know it's one bitcoin 0 0.9 or, or 0 0.98 or something like this and so because of that it's not really a wrapped asset does that make sense i mean you can if you did do that, he said, you know what, we're not going to do this thing. You can get rid of the economic security if you want to. Ignore the economic security if you want to. And then it becomes a wrapped asset. Sure. At that point. Right. But wouldn't – so – but is, it's your actual – is it your actual balance that would be fluctuating? So so the, the, the trade account assets, the trade assets, mm -hmm. they're custodied in a network module, right? So, so you don't actually hold them in your, right. in your balance. Does, does that balance – so say there's a negative interest rate applied, you know, 99% of the time, it's just going to be what it is. You've, you've won trade BTC mm -hmm. and you have a trade BTC. Mm -hmm. um, say there's a negative interest rate because, you know, all of a sudden, you know, bot bottom of the bear market, like we're at the security cap. Does your balance start to actually go down or is it only when you make a trade that, that, no, that you're, that's you're, applied? No, your balance starts to go down at that point, right? And it goes down rel yeah, relative yeah. to how 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 much under secured we are if we're like barely under the under the thing then the negative interest rate is you know it's basically near like zero right it's not, it's, it's so insignificant that it wouldn't be and no one would care um but if it gets you know the, the value that is twice the value of the room then that would be you know a higher negative interest rate right and be, but your balance is actually going down at that moment to create the incentive that like hey We've got too much assets, not enough security. Um, we're going to start taking your assets from you. In effect, we're going to swap it to Rune, and then we're going to add it to the security, give it to the nodes. And by doing so, the negative interest rate is actually causing the network to correct autonomously, like correct the balance between the assets and the security, right? And by doing so, the negative interest rate will also naturally, on its own, naturally decrease. Because of this, you know, right. selling of the assets, buying of the ruin, putting the ruin into the security side, um, there's like kind of that natural pressure that's just pushing in that direction. Now, the price of ruin could continue to fall more than this negative interest rate, sure. I mean, at some point in time, the negative interest rate becomes large enough that it balances out or whatever. But like, you have a constant pressure of like selling the assets into ruin and the ruin putting the, the bond so you're it's, it is a self-correcting system in that in that sense got it so you in, in order to create a, a trade asset do you have to deposit that asset mm -hmm. or can you say you have you have btc or like say you have some other asset can you like swap to that trade asset or the only way to create a trade asset is to deposit that specific asset into no, into the chain you can or like you can swap to it as well yep uh, it also works. You can deposit directly, or you can swap to it, or you can withdraw it directly. Okay. So, and and if you have like trade BTC, then you can also obviously just like swap to you know native ETH, and just that's just a withdrawal of your you have your trade BTC does a swap, and then you just get your your ETH up. Yep. I mean, technically, you can you can swap a trade asset, a Bitcoin trade asset, to, to layer one Bitcoin. 
or you can just do a withdraw. I, mean, I don't know why you would do the swap in this scenario because you would just, why would you want to incur the fees of, of the swap itself? It doesn't make any sense. You would just probably just do a withdraw. I see. So it's two different mechanisms, uh, redeeming the asset versus, yep. uh, redeeming it versus swapping it would be two, two separate things. Yep. I mean, mm. right. Well, I mean, you, you could swap trade, like a trade Bitcoin to a layer one ETH. And that might make some sense, right? Because you, you have to pay the fees no matter what. If you're going to get to the trade ETH, you still got to pay the fees. And the fees will be, uh, I think, the same, if, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. I think it's going to be the same. And so then it then just becomes the equivalent. Just, you're just saving an extra transaction at the other side of it to do a withdraw on the trade account. Got it. And the real advantage to trade assets is that um, there's less slippage, correct? Because it moves the price less than a synthetic asset would because, um, well, they, maybe you can explain why that is or if that's true. Yeah, it, it, the benefit primarily is that um, when, you tr when, you, when somebody does an organic trade and they, they sell $100 worth of rune into Bitcoin and our bot has to sell $200 worth of synthetic Bitcoin to correct the price. And that's kind of like, a, it's a counterintuitive and it doesn't make sense unless you understand the mechanics of how synths work and all that kind of stuff. But just trust me that that's the case for now because it's just kind of hard to explain it. Um, I can do it if I had like a whiteboard. It's a lot easier to explain with the whiteboard, but it's hard to do it verbally, you know? Um, and so it, it just requires twice the amount of capital to be able to, you know, arb that $100. You need $200 of the capital to arb that $100. Uh, and this just kind of corrects it. So that's like if you do a hundred dollar swap, a hundred dollar swap in the reverse direction will arb it back. And so when somebody's doing um, a streaming swap, like we just like for example, we just saw a, a streaming swap for like a hundred Bitcoin. It was like ninety nine point eight Bitcoin or something like this. And we just saw someone do a, a streaming swap of that. It was a large trade, but you know it only kind of was half part. It was half successful. Like some of the swaps, the, the streaming swaps were successful. Some of them failed largely because the ARB bot wasn't able to ARB quick enough or to keep up with the demand. And, you know, and then we had like a split situation where you, you got some of your Bitcoin back and some of your, you got some of the WBC you were looking to get, right? Or something like that. But the trade account, if that was live at this particular time, you would have twice the efficiency. And so the, the, with the same amount of capital that the ARB bot had, you would have been, had been twice, uh, you would have gotten the, the, the swapper um, a larger percentage of his trade to be executed through the system, if not the entire thing. Probably the entire thing, I think. I think it would be most likely it would have been the entire swap would have been successful. So it's really critical for price execution of this network. And that's where this is, the, this is what this is geared towards. It's really critical for price execution for ARBs to ARB a streaming swap. If ARBs aren't ARB ARBing, Streaming swaps doesn't really work very well, right? It doesn't, really, it doesn't really give you a really good price execution, right? You need ARBs to be ARBing. And and this makes them kind of like kind of like they're twice the liquidity they have today, in a sense, right? And so it makes them twice more efficient, twice more beneficial, twice. So you're you're gonna see naturally a lot more tra trades be more successful. You'll see trades executed with a with a better uh, execution price. Like it's just going to be uh, much more effective and efficient for the protocol. And w this is one of the things we, I think we should need to focus on as a protocol. It's just is getting the best price execution in the field, especially as new ones, new protocols are coming out. We got Maya, you got Chainflip, you got Sarai, you've got you know I think Zeta Chain and Wormholes doing something or whatever it was, and blah blah blah. Like there's more competition coming in the space finally. So it's shocking that it took this fucking long for that to happen. Um, cause we've been in this space forever, but we're finally starting to see more people come in this space. And we, I want to make sure that we stay highly competitive, that we, we can outperform every other decks out there that does cross chain swaps. And we do it better in every regard, in the speed and execution of the trade and the price execution, like the liquidity of it. I mean, Everything we can think of, um, we want to make sure we can do better than everybody else in all cases and all scenarios. At least the best that we can. Yeah. So okay. So I I, I could see that it, it just makes ARB twice as efficient. That makes sense for someone that's just doing a, a trade. So let, let's say you know there's you know 
spot traders who want to trade, um, you know, pe people that may, might trade using since today just because there's no native settlement fee. Um, does that mean that there's essentially, so there's, there is, does that mean there's less fees for, for trading with a, with a trade asset? So let's say the, the you know, the equivalent, the, the equivalent trade like ETH to BDC, ETH to BDC, uh, native and with trade assets, is the slippage the same? Is there less slippage? Obviously there's no native, you know, uh, L1 gas fee, which is which is great, but is is um, the slippage incurred the same, or is there less slippage oh, the, for a, the slippage uh, for a trade would, would be the same as a synthetic today? I think. Got it. So I, I, that, that's also the, that would, that's also identical to the yeah. Slip, the slippage would be the right? same. So. I mean, I, I, I can't. We at some point in time we had some like virtual pool depths happening around synthetics to kind of incentivize. Arbs to use it over layer one assets. And I think we actually removed that and we just put a higher like TSS signing fee, like it was like a, a dollar or something like this. So I don't think we actually do that anymore. So it would, it would perform in terms of slippage, it would be the, in terms of fees paid in the trade or swap would be the same as pretty much anything else, you know? Got it. So it, it, everything else being equal in user experience to a synthetic today. So people can essentially just move to, yeah. move to trade assets and, uh, then they just have the advantages of using trade assets. Or so for the, for a person in that scenario, what's the advantage of using the the, the trade asset over a synthetic? Uh, I mean, there's a couple. Um, the first thing is it's it's geared primarily, at least on the initial like um, goal, is to gear towards ARBs. That's the first kind of first and foremost. So ARBs can ARB the pool much more effectively. Uh, and and ARBs would switch over because it, they would just need to use less cap, have less capital locked up to ARB any particular trade. Yeah, I mean, or, it, what's the incentive it, for them to switch I, over? Most like what's going to happen is 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 um, we'll probably disable the ability to use sense for ARB purposes. Like it's, we'll we'll force the community commute over it. Just be, it's, I don't I don't think it's any it benefit. I'm not sure what the benefit to be honest with you to to ARB is, um, but. We it's, it, the benefits to the protocol, and so it makes more sense to the protocol for the. So we'll probably just like force ARBs over to it, and then, and no no ARB has come to me or or anybody that I know of and voiced any concern about that about this trade accounts idea. It's just to them, it's the same. Like it doesn't really make it that much, but just to my knowledge, at least. Um, so we'll probably just disable the ability just to, to arbitrarily just mint since, right? Which will cause ARBs to, to to leave since and then just start using this system. You can use it if you want to. If you're like a trader, trader, right, and you're just like you like the day trade or, or or you know high frequency trading. If you wanted to get into that, you can use this particular you know thing for the, for that purpose. Um, and then the third purpose, I think, which is my kind of uh, my hope, my goal is to get to limit orders and order books, and that this this would be the asset that people would probably use. Yeah, true. Let's um. I mean, I feel like I had one more question about trade accounts. Um, but either way, it, this this kind of paves the way for order books and limit orders because that that that's all going to be built on top of right. of trade accounts, right? right? Yep. Yeah. I'm super excited for for order books. I, it's, like, it's actually like it's better to use this for order books than it is for synths. And the reason why that is, is because when you acquire a synth you have to swap to it. So you have to pay a fee to get the synth, right? And then you have to pay a fee to exit the synth, right? And so if you are a high frequency trader or you're like, you know, winter mute or like, you know, a Cumberland or whatever the hell it is, paying a fee every time you enter and exit like that is, you know, it's, it can get expensive because you're doing a lot of trading. But with trade accounts, when you, when you deposit and when you withdraw, there's no fee associated other than the layer one, you know, gas fees, you know, and that kind of stuff, right? So you don't have to pay a fee to, to enter to, to kind of to acquire a trade asset or to withdraw a, um, a trade asset other than the gas fees, right, of, of like Bitcoin or whatnot. So it's, it's cheaper uh, for people. It's more, it's more usable for institutions to use this versus versus a synthetic. So it's better better for order books um, to use this particular kind of asset, which is nice, it's really nice. It ends up just kind of being the same kind of experience as like what you do with Coinbase or Binance. Like when you trade on Coinbase or Binance, 
you don't do a swap. It's not, I mean, not really. You never, re you never swap with Coinbase or Binance. What you do is you sign in, you know, you get a deposit address, you deposit some Bitcoin or whatever it is, and then they accredit your account like six hours later, over the hell the fucking time frame is for it, you know. And then you have this like, you know, Bitcoin in your wallet that's effectively an IOU, right? Which is what a, tr a trade account is. It's kind of like an IOU, similar to it, but a little bit different. Um, and then you just start doing your trading and like you open a limit order to do this and, and to buy this and sell this and then buy that and sell that and do this, that, blah, 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 whatever it is you do. And then at the end of it all, you, you're left with a bunch of, you know, Bitcoin or ETH in your wallet and your kind of like account, your Binance account, and then you withdraw it, right, to ETH, right? Like you just exit the ETH to your, you know, OF address. And so conceptually, like limit orders on ThorChain becomes the same kind of experience, the same kind of UX as what you do if you're, you know, a pro trader on Binance or Coinbase or Kraken or OKX or whatever it is. And now you can have people build, like you trust a Thor, Thor swap or somebody else to build entire UIs that are not geared towards swappers. It's geared towards traders. It's geared towards people who are used to using centralized exchanges and they're, you know, for, to do all their trading and whatnot. And you just give them basically almost an identical experience with lower fees right i think that's that's going to be that can introduce a lot of people and expand our community and expand our market expand our use cases expand the, the type of people that we attract quite significantly theoretically yeah especially with no slippage going in and out of a trade asset because like you see this all the all, all day in the thorchain dev discord in the alerts channel i see like you know tons of tons of people that are streaming They're, right now it's a streaming swap that they have to do to go from bitcoin to synthetic bitcoin so that, that's five basis points of slippage basically right off the top that you're gonna have to make back through arbing uh but it, it, it makes a lot of sense that arbs would switch over like that that, that is exactly what i was looking for when i was asking like what's the incentive to to switch over it's like you don't have to pay to get into the system you can just deposit yep. and you have a have a trade asset that's that's in there yep that's also true also true i should have mentioned that earlier but yeah yeah that seems like the really big um boon there and one more question about this uh is people that, that request to come up we can we can get to some questions about sure. about order books less trade assets but so okay so let's say you have uh trade btc and you want to swap to to trade eth or trade usdc mm -hmm. Uh, where, where does the asset come from on the other end? So like, it's just extra assets that are in the pool. Like how, how are those trade assets being added on the other end? If not for like pool rebalancing, yeah, like, yeah. where does the trade asset come from that you're swapping? So to? think of this way, like think about in, putting your mind, like kind of four pockets, right? The first pocket is just like Bitcoin outside the pool. And then the second pocket is just like the Bitcoin pool itself, which has Bitcoin and, and, and Rune in it. The third pocket is the ETH pool, which has a ETH and Rune in it. And the fourth pocket is just ETH outside of the pool, the trade asset. And so what you're doing when you trade, when you go from a trade asset to trade asset is you're, you're taking the, the, the first pocket, you're taking the, the trade Bitcoin, you're moving it from outside of the pool to be inside of the pool, right? Which adds Bitcoin to the pool and then takes out Rune. Rune gets then added to the ETH pool, which then takes out ETH from the ETH pool. And then the ETH just gets moved to uh, the ETH outside of the pool, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it's, gotcha. So it's just, it's just an accounting It's It's just accounting. It's, like, it's not even, inside. nothing's yeah, moving right, right. fucking anywhere, really. Like everything is, it's just like, oh, the number of Bitcoin in the pool is, increased and the number of rune in the uh, bitcoin pool is decreased and the amount of rune is increased in the in the pool and of eth and the amount of eth in the pool is decreased i mean that's but the number of eth and bitcoin blah blah, blah and rune like the, on, the, on the network in the vaults whatever is unchanged right it's just an accounting thing uh let's get to some of the people who came up here uh Paulie, what's up, man? Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Um, I'm not sure who, who I'm speaking to on the Thor account, and it's it's all good either way, but Chad, I'm Pauly. Uh, I don't think we've ever uh, interacted before. Um, How are you doing? Yeah, I'm great, man. Thanks. Happy Friday to you guys, if it's Friday where you are. Um, 
I just saw that this space was open and I figured that I would just jump in. And, you know, I noticed that when I came into the room, there was like around 70 people and now we're already coming up on a thousand people. So that's awesome. And I'm glad that there's a large audience here. So I figured maybe, um, is it okay with you guys if I ask a couple questions and, and um, share a couple things? Well, first of all, a thousand people. Holy shit. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, there's <laughs> I, nine, didn't, there's I didn't know that. Yeah, I bring a I large didn't. audience. I bring a large audience. So there's, <laughs> I didn't there's, know that one. There's 911 people listening live now, um, which wow. is great. Which is great. That's right? great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, ask your question. Yeah. Yeah. So I just for context, like um, I'm the founder of a project called Pond Zero X, right? And right now we're using uh, the Uniswap infrastructure on the back end to route uh, all of our transaction volume. And uh, the DEX is about 161 days old, and we've just surpassed. Uh, half a billion dollars in volume. And the reason that this is relevant to Thor's, I'm not just trying to talk about like myself and what I do, but we've been in contact with uh, with some of the, the team members at Thor, and we're very interested in migrating over to the Thor uh, infrastructure, right? And so, the, you know, that being said, I'm curious if you could just like kind of share for at least like, you know, the 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 900 or so people that I brought in here, um, maybe if you could just kind of give like a general introduction to like what Thor is and why it's like superior in many ways. And I, you know, for, for, for starters, like I know that it's chain agnostic, you can trade native Bitcoin on Thor chain. You can also trade, you know, other networks that are not EVM machines. Right. Um, that's my understanding. So maybe that's kind of what I would request as like a, a, a thing since there's such a large group of new, new people here. Right. So you you built a new dex and you, and you want to utilize uh, Thorchain within the context of this new dex that you oh, I, that, th to be honest like that's something that like we don't even need to discuss in here because we already have like the the contacts uh, with with some team like Gavin is who we've been working with on that and we already have yep. the engineers connected and the repositories and everything but Tyler Reynolds is a good friend of mine and he's the person that introduced me to Thor and yep. um, so shout out Tyler amazing person and super intelligent I think he's great but yeah I guess I think it would be interesting for myself and for the audience, maybe if you could just give us like very basic introduction to what ThorChain is and, and what's good about it, if, if that works for you guys. Sure. Um, Kyle, do you want me to do it or do you want to take the honors? All right. Well, I, I'll, I'll start it off and you can, you can pick up wherever I leave off. So ThorChain is just native asset infrastructure. You can think of it as a centralized exchange, just running on decentralized infrastructure. So it's just it's a framework to custody bitcoin and any other asset in a in a vault that's sharded into many different keys and then all you need to do is just deposit assets into the vault and uh it can swap cross chain so you can do anything you could do on a centralized exchange just with uh on on these decentralized rails so you can trade native bitcoin to ether to stable coins and uh yeah thorchain powers the cross-chain rails for, uh, you know, a ton of different projects in this space, like, like Shapeshift, uh, Trust Wallet, we do the, uh, uh, the cross-chain swaps for, for them and a bunch of, a bunch of other guys in this space that use our liquidity. And uh, yeah, it's the, it's the biggest cross-chain infrastructure project that's out there. Just answering the question, like, how do you custody native Bitcoin in a vault that's run by you know, anonymous, anonymous individuals and have that be economically secure. So the entire ThorChain framework is just built around that question and, and securing uh, assets in a sharded vault, essentially. I have a question, Kyle, if it's okay. Um, and and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm being educated myself. Like I'm not like pretending to not know this stuff. A lot of this stuff is very new to me as well, but my engineers are super familiar with Thor and you know, they're the ones who are like the most geeked out about like the, the concept of transitioning over because I think that compared to Uniswap, it would first of all offer the ability to trade with the native Bitcoin, which is to me a, a massive value add, right? But of but in addition to that, the chain agnostic factor is powerful to me and compelling. But also, I believe that you guys are able to achieve better market rates than anyone else right now, and and then you have the streaming swaps, which allow people to conduct large, uh, large size, like basically whale volume transactions without getting impacted with like a massive amount of price impact or slippage, right? Is, are those things, anything you could add some color to? Yeah, that's it's something we, we kind of innovated was this idea of what we call a streaming swap. And it just allows, uh, basically it automatically just cuts a large trade into like a bunch of small ones. So you get the best price execution possible. And with that, like you can get something as low as five basis points. Like oftentimes people make trades and they, 
they get better better execution than you can get on Coinbase, Binance, Uniswap, even Curve for coin, you know stable to stables. Like it's pretty it's pretty awesome, you know, to think that we we're now DEXs are now surpassing uh, centralized exchanges is, is unreal. Yeah, I mean it's it's funny that CZ predicted that himself. He was like, I believe that that uh, you know DeFi is going to be sort of eclipsed by uh, by CeFi is going to be eclipsed by DeFi, right? I think he said that at the be- like at the end of 2023, maybe. Which I I thought that was an interesting little tidbit to catch from him, right? Well, it makes logical sense because a centralized exchange like Coinbase or whatever, right? Taking them for example, they have to. Um, have a huge company with hundreds and hundreds of employees, right? They have like a couple hundred security engineers alone. Well, not even devs, but just like people dedicated towards security. They have to deal with the government. They have to deal with all these things. They have to have uh, costs of operations and this kind of stuff. But but a DEX can just you know be built and 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 just deployed by a handful of devs. Like you know initially, like Thorkin was built and in, in just by three people, right? Over the course of like two or three years. And you can just build this thing, and, and it doesn't have to have this kind of huge infrastructure behind it that requires huge, like hundreds of millions of fucking dollars to operate. So it, it has an ability to, to undersell everybody else, in a sense, just because it's so cheap to interact with it, and so cheap to build, it, and so cheap to operate it. Kind of similar to like how like AI is like really cheap. You can do lots of things with AI like really fast and really cheap. It's, it's a little bit like that. So it, it's inevitable that that like DEXs in general or DeFi in general will kind of eclipse uh, centralized systems. And the only way that cannot be the case, at least in my opinion, is that if, if, is if institutions themselves are prohibited or nervous to interact with DeFi protocols because they're just nervous what Gary Gensler is going to say about it, right? If we get, if we get uh, clarity from, you know, the Congress and whatnot that, you know, that it's okay to swap with a AMM protocol. It doesn't matter where the liquidity comes from, but you can just go ahead and swap with it, which I think that's going to happen at some point because, it's, it's, because I think it's in the best interest of, of, of markets. That would be like, that would be the, the last nail in the coffin. And then, then everything would be done through DeFi. It wouldn't make any sense except for the US dollar um, to interact with DeFi at all. Um, just, to, just to clarify, I believe Gavin is, is one of the, fa- the three founders that you mentioned, right? Um, no. no. So Gavin, Gavin's the uh, CEO of Nine Realms. Who's one? We. So I'm, I'm part of the Nine Realms team. Uh, familiar Cal here from the Nine Realms uh-huh. team. Uh, so we do uh, we do infrastructure, security, core dev work for Thorchain. So Gavin's just a huge Thorchad and someone that's been building in the space for for a long time. Like founding engineer at at uh, BitGo and uh, you know big big resume in the space and just like and we're we're all just just chads that are passionate about. Uh, cross chain exchange and just being like being being the future of decentralized liquidity because we i mean we really do believe that everything is going to be moving to decentralized rails you know sometime in, in the next 10 years it, it just makes logical sense just because of the you know increased capital efficiency and just the, the like you know that exchanges are going to have to rebalance their liquidity somewhere there needs to be a base layer for liquidity where exchanges can go well we need more bitcoin uh you know we, where, where are they going to get it there's no native way to to do that you need to go OTC, it would make infinitely more sense for there to be, you know, this base layer of liquidity where they can really tap into. So we're just, you know, that that's our group. And, you know, Gavin's on uh, with us. And awesome. Just, you know, really believes awesome. in the future of this space. Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't even have full clarity about what it was, but I knew he was close to the project. And I think Tyler uh, introduced us, which was amazing of him. Um, it's funny, like for, for some context, one of the additional, like, I, I think that Uniswap is, like, a, a reasonably good experience, right? Just in terms of, like, being a user and, and being able to use the product, right? But it's funny because I don't know if you guys know Hayden or whatever, but he has me blocked. And he has also blocked the DEX, Pawn 0X, uh, even though, we're, you know, we're, we're pushing half a billion dollars in volume through his exchange. So I thought that that was a very strange, strange gesture to, to block uh, the person responsible for bringing him half a billion dollars in volume. Like in my mind, I thought maybe that would be something that you would want as like a protocol founder, right? I don't know. 
Yeah. I mean, he blocked Thorchain like three years ago and saying it wouldn't work. And that was a scam before it was, <laughs> before it, before it existed. So, I mean, that, that's, that's what happens uh, over here. He still, he still has Thorchain blocked. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, before it came out, he was like this, you know, this won't yeah. work. This isn't, this isn't I possible. guess he has a pattern then, of being butthurt. You know, three years running a now. pattern of butthurtness. But anyways, I, I speak kind of crudely, so I won't project that onto you guys. But the last question that I have is, Right now, we're dealing with this network congestion on ETH, right? The Ethereum network has been very congested, and I speculate that a lot of that has to do with this this sort of silly scammer cabal promoting this nonsense, ERC-404, which is like this totally broken and exploitable uh, fake token standard that's not vetted by the Ethereum Foundation or anything like that. But neither here nor there, the, the network is congested, right? Regardless of the reason why. And I'm curious, like when the, when the Ethereum network is congested or when the Bitcoin network is congested, is there anything about ThorChain um, that is like able to sort of insulate itself from the affected congestion or does the congestion directly impact uh, your guys' network in, in a similar way? Um, no, it, we, it does have some kind of impact. I mean, we, we are kind of, we have to deal with Bitcoin layer one because that's what we do, right? And so any, anything that's happening there inherently has to happen to us. But the one, the one exception, though, I think would say, as we were talking earlier about um, about uh, trade accounts, is that like you can you can trade on Thorchain with your Bitcoin, whatever, and, and, and you know, and exit to layer one Bitcoin if you want to, and you can ex and you can kind of skip all the gas fees, you know, associated with Bitcoin or ETH or whatever. And once once trade accounts is live, and you actually you can do it today with synthetics if you really wanted to go, you know, have at it. But uh, trade accounts will be even even better for the for the for the protocol and for the community. But yeah, so you, you can you can kind of skip all that and just trade directly that way if you want to. For sure. And and I guess like just my understanding is that Thor right now, you guys kind of have the, the ability to offer the best rates um, on the entire decentralized market. Would you guys agree with that, generally speaking? I haven't seen anybody beat us yet, to be honest. So, yeah. yeah. So, so that's 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 like that's a big part of my motivation to want to migrate over to the Thor chain rails is because. The, the vision of like what we're doing is just all about delivering the maximum value to all of the users, right? And to right. reward them for participating in, in everything as much as possible. But, you know, if we can if we can deliver people a, a trading experience where it's it's just as good, if not better, in terms of speed and, and ease of use than Uniswap, but also more competitive and better market rates, like to me, that's a home run. So right. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm just excited to continue progressing down that road. We're working on many different things at once. So sometimes the bandwidth can be a little... Uh, directed in 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 one way where you know it might take some time to to finalize the implementation of that but i have yes. a feeling that um we'll be in touch more and um, cool. yeah i just i want to thank you guys for sharing the stage with me with now there's almost 1500 people listening now so i'm going to step <laughs> out of the way here and let you guys do what you want to do but um you this is me on social media and uh maybe we can chat on the side sometime and yeah sure. i really appreciate yeah. it yeah feel free to, feel free to dm me if you want to but I, I agree that like I think being decentralized is great, but it's not it's not the only attribute, right? Being also having Bex X is also you know important to, to get adoption and and pulling away from centralized exchanges and that kind of thing. And that's have, having what you said, having best X best Bex price execution, right? Having oh yeah, yeah, best execution, best, the sure. best on the best on fees, basically, right? That's like it's great to be decentralized. That's obviously a, a big goal, and that's one of the things we the things that we started off with predominantly, just making sure we were properly decentralized, like fully. Uh, but we can't stop there. We have to. We have to beat on beat every central exchange, especially on every attribute that we can possibly muster, with the exception of like dollars. We can't fuck around with dollars for obvious reasons. But except for that one thing, we want to beat them in every regard. Amazing. Well, yeah, I think that um, the the future looks bright, and um, you know, I think it's just about who can deliver the best for for the people that are using this stuff. And of course, like. One one thing that I know I kind of have as a strength, and it's funny, like you know, that we were able to bring so many more listeners here, is I'm able to bring an audience. And sometimes, sometimes like the best engineers in the world can deliver the execution and, and all the tech, but sometimes we have to combine forces and make sure we bring the audience, right, and the users too. So I don't know. I'm hoping that I can contribute to what you guys are doing, and uh, I hope vice versa as well. So thanks for having me, and um, you guys have a great weekend. I added you as a friend on here, Chad. So we'll be in touch. Great. I'll follow okay. you as well. Thanks, guys. Take care. Cool, man. Um, yeah, that was dope. <laughs> thanks for coming up, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we are actually we are going to be at Denver. We're gonna we're gonna throw a uh, 
a little happy hour on most likely March 2nd. So if anyone's coming out to East Denver, uh, you know, Thorchain community is definitely going to be there. Chad's going to be there. Uh, we're we're going to make a presence out there. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to, to meeting some people and, you know, talking about cross-chain liquidity. Uh, we're, we're huge Bitcoiners. So we love talking about, you know, everything related to, to Bitcoin, to DeFi, uh, Ethereum, you know, that's that's us. So thanks, everyone, for joining. Who's next? Uh, John, John, what's up? Yo, John, you there? Do not hear you. Nope. He's there, but he's not able to speak, I guess. His mic is broken. <laughs> All right. All well, right. He'll, we'll come back with him later. Next. All right, let's, right. let's clear let's let's clear off the stage this is something going on here <laughs> uh crypto italia what, what's going on oh wait sorry let me bite him back oh did you kick everybody off the stage As you said, and people back here. There we go, John. You there? Yeah. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Yep. What's cool, up? Cool. Cool. Uh, so I got exposure to Thorchain basically through Pond, uh, and I'm just checking out your guys' website, and I see Savers Vaults, and I'm just curious on what's the kind of an explanation between the Rune BTC APR, for example, and the difference between the Savers APR. Like, kind of just a brief explanation on kind of what I'm looking at here. Yeah. So essentially, there's two different ways to provide liquidity on Thorchain, and that's either dual sided or single sided. And uh, so like any other AMM, you can provide dual liquidity. So it's it's paired with Rune. So you pair your native BTC with uh, with native Rune and that goes in the pool and a dual dual LPs receive basically twice the yield of a, of a regular LP. Uh, sorry, of a single sided LP. And uh, but they also receive the impermanent loss of the single sided uh, savers. Uh, the, the people that only provide BTC, essentially. So the people who provide just BTC, it's also providing liquidity, but um, you receive less of the uh, less of the liquidity fees, but you're um, you're essentially principal protected. So it's just it's two different risk profiles for two different types of of LPs. One that's more levered towards you know rune exposure, and then one that's just single sided uh, BTC. So they're they're two two ways to provide liquidity that have kind of a different risk profile and uh, just like different mechanics behind them. Cool. Thanks. Hey. Yep. No worries. Alexander. Thanks. Hey guys. Thanks for having me. So I try Tor swap over the, the app, right? App Tor swap that finance and I use earn and I actually have four positions and one with your notices, you say, okay, BNB on the beacon chain is, is uh, shutting down or sunset. So I actually wanted to withdraw my put there in urn. And whenever I do this, I go to withdraw. Then I have this nice slider, but the withdraw button actually never gets active. So I tried to get some help over Discord. They say it sent first 0 0.001 BNB to this address with this memo, and then it should work and stuff. But uh, until now, uh, the button is not active. And I use uh, a key store right, to connect to your site. Sure, sure. So we, we can't really do technical support in a Twitter spaces because I don't think it's really inter entertaining or interesting for the, the rest of the community who are here listening to us. Um, sorry, my, my thing just stopped working all of a sudden. No, 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 you're good. Uh, uh, yeah, so you should you should go back into that Discord ticket and, and talk with them because uh, so this is for for just general like you know Thorchain things. You should you should talk with the interface that you're using. You can use ThorSwap and talk in their ticket. There's also other interfaces like Shapeshift or AsgardX. You could load the same wallet into and just to go to withdraw. So okay, thanks. Uh, but but Discord is the right communication channel then. For, for yeah okay. yeah Thor, Thor swap discord open up a ticket in there don't answer dms or anything like that and <laughs> there it is I always always scammers in the dms watch out yeah, for that. thank you yep no worries uh, uh talk about order books some more um sure. 
Yeah. So, okay. So order books built on top of trade assets and that's not the next feature that's coming. Like, I think we're going to see memo lists, um, most likely in between, uh, trade assets and, and okay. order books. So, um, you know, it probably coming sometime in the next like couple of months, but just mechanics wise for order books. Um, so how exactly is, is order books going to function? So you, you need a, a trade asset to start it and like, or like what's, what's the user flow of someone, you know, placing a limit order on Thorchain? Like what, what parameters do they need to, um, to, to put in to actually get a limit order started? Yeah. I mean, it's not too dissimilar from what you do today. If you're doing a limit order or anywhere else, you just you, you make a deposit of some asset, like let's call it Bitcoin, for example. And then you, you know, open an order, a limit order for ETH and you you have one Bitcoin, which is your kind of your source asset. And then your destination is ETH and you want, you know, 35 ETH. I'm, I'm making up a random number, but like whatever the hell the number would be. Um, you want some quantity of ETH and then you're, the, the order just kind of is put on the network and it just kind of waits until that thing can be executed. Once executed, it gets you that your 35 ETH. Got it. So you, so you don't. Add, it's not versus USDC or, or anything else. It's really just uh, like you're, you're putting in what asset you want out on the other end, no matter what it is. So you, it, right. you could put in a, you could put in BTC and say like, I want USDC out once once yep. this price limit is hit, or you could say put BTC in. I want ETH out once this once this is hit, or any combination right. in right. between. Yeah, I think perps will probably be USD based. Um, if we ever get down that far or do, or do perpetuals, but, but the limit orders, it's just, it's just, it should be very, it should be very uh, comfortable and familiar for people. Yeah, man, that that's going to be so cool. And we, we talked about this a couple of times, but just limit orders uh, making arbitrage even more efficient. Um, yep. I, I'm really looking forward to the day once all our moves to order books and essentially what I, what I think this is going to do, at least my theory on this is that, um, ARBs will start looking and aggregating all of the other limit orders on every centralized exchange that they're, that they're connected to as like an ARB bot, right? So yep. essentially what DoorChain becomes is like the aggregator of all limit orders and all liquidity in the space because, is, you know, let's say that the price is, you know, there's one price on Binance, there's one price, price on Kraken, there's another one on Coinbase and every other centralized exchange. Uh, you could just put limit orders down on, on DoorChain using trade assets and essentially once the once the thorchain price is uh is moved to a price where you know that you can make a profit on any of those exchanges your order is just executed and then you can then your bot just takes care of the arb and right. uh so essentially it becomes the the ultimate price aggregator that's a, a proactive price aggregator that right. would would essentially um just put in all the all of the liquidity from all the other exchanges pretty effortlessly because right now all ARB is reactive to the price changes. Like when the price right. changes and there's an ARB opportunity, then right. the ARBs come in. But this way, uh, ARBs can just put their limit orders in before there's ever, ever any price change. So you're always getting best X on uh, on Thorchain, no matter right. what. Yeah, it's it's much more more efficient in, in a lot of ways. It's it's like there's there's really what will, will be three different forms of ARBing on the network, and this new one was like kind of be the most efficient system so even within a streaming swap now if you're making a streaming swap you, you make a swap and then maybe you know five blocks blocks later it makes another trade and a sub trade and a sub trade like every five blocks whatever it is and you're kind of making an assumption that arbs are, are being in between those five blocks which maybe that's true maybe that's not true right either way you're, you're fine the network takes care of you but like but in this case there's no kind of like trying every five blocks whatever it just it does it whenever the opportunity is there so it, it so if the it maximizes your trade against the ARBs as efficiently as possible, um, which is really kind of really bullish for the, for the project in many ways, actually. Like, right now, like if you do an ARB, let me give you an example. If you do an ARB, an ARB swap, right? And let's just say it takes an, uh, a, a, sorry, a regular swap through streaming swaps, rather. It takes like a full day to do a trade, like every sub trade, every, you know, Every five blocks, blah, 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 and it takes, you know, it does 300 swaps, sub swaps, blah, 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 and it takes about a day, whatever the hell the number is. Well, instead of doing that, it would just, it would just execute the trade as fast as the ARBs have capital for. Like it's the stronger the ARBs, the faster that whole thing would execute. So it would be just as, it could be literally like the utmost, 
that the ARB system, the ARBs are willing to provide capital for, it will just be like as, as instantaneous as possible relative to what ARBs can do rather than just like, oh, well, just like we'll split it over like a course of a day and, you know, blah, blah, blah for like a super large trade. And it just becomes like so fast, so efficient. And ARBs can cycle their ca capital through the network much faster. So the number of times, like if you've got like, let's say you got $2 million in an ARB and you're just like constantly ARBing, kind of going around in circles, so to speak, to close the loops. You can then do that, like, you know, instead of doing it 30 times a day, you can do it 50 times a day or some other number. So you actually make the ARBs themselves also more efficient, effective and efficient inherently. So, so it's just like, it's so bullish for the, for the project and so bullish for um, the trade volume of the network. So, uh, okay. Qu question for you, because this is something that we talked about with trade accounts being twice as efficient as synthetic assets for, for trade volume. Do you expect trade volume to decrease once we switch over to, uh, to trade accounts rather than to synthetic assets? Because if, if ARB is essentially twice as capital efficient, then that means that there would be, like naturally there'd be twice as, half as much ARB as there is today, like given the same amount of organic trading activity on all the different front ends. So, do we, so is the expectation that volume is likely to, to decrease with the same, uh, yeah, same activity? I would... I would expect to see our like total swap volume to decrease in the short term, but on, because of the efficiency that it gains to the pro, like to the protocol in general, I would expect in the middle or long term to be more. Do you mean by that? Okay, wait, can you can you explain that concept again? I, I think we we went over that before, but like why? Yeah, why exactly would you expect it to, to increase over the long term? If if the especially if the liquidity fees that. Um, it would be generating would only be half because there's half the volume, if, if that's correct. Well, yeah, because because the ARBs are going to be twice more uh, more efficient and more effective, which means the total amount of capital that the network can trade in a given amount of time would be increased and still ex execute at a competitive rate. So, because you're making the network, you know, more more capital efficient, you can do a higher volume of trading, which will, you know, generally speaking, would it would advocate for that or or incur that just because. Like when, when you have a high TVL, when you have a deep pool, right, you're more likely to get more trades because you're more capital efficient, right? The, the amount of slip that you would experience in a deep pool versus a shallow pool is a lot less. And so people are more likely to trade in deep pools than they are in shallow pools just in general, right? So by being more capital efficient, you kind of invite more capital in, in a matter of speaking. It won't be instantaneous. It won't be like, oh, we flip the feature on, and then like day two, it's like, you know, blah blah blah. That's why I say like a medium, maybe long term. It takes time for the market to react to, to the conditions of the market. So it'll it'll take some time, but but I think initially we'll see a, a decrease in overall trade volume because ARBs are being much more efficient, and then over the long term, we'll just invite more capital. Word. Yeah, man. Order book's going to be awesome. So the, the general order that things are going to be shipped or trade accounts will be in the next release. So, uh, you know, probably in the next like two weeks or so, we'll trade trade assets will be available. Um, and then after that, I think the next major feature that's planned is memo list transactions. And then after that would be would be order books. As, as far as I'm aware, that's the general order that, that things would be shipped. So, um, yeah, pro probably looking at like, you know, uh, like, a month or two at least for for order books and you know probably more time than that just because just you know testing and validating all the new features that are coming on is going to take some time especially like you know brand new primitives like trade assets and memo lists but it's all all being worked on uh you know synchronously and uh you know all all shipped all queued up to come out uh you know in subsequent releases so those are all the, those are all the near term priorities yeah, I, I think uh, the way that I'm seeing it at this point is that we'll probably have trade accounts done, um, you know, in, within the next like couple of weeks or so. I'm thinking, although that launched on mainnet, um, memoless transactions will probably be at the end of Q1, maybe early Q2, and then we'll probably see uh, order books probably end of Q Q2. I'm I'm, th I'm thinking at this point. Sweet, yeah, those are all big features. Want to dive into memo lists uh, real quick? Well, you know what was funny? I, I was just talking to Orion before this this space, and we were just chatting about and you, about 
um, the bull market and how you know, things are just looking really positive for the protocol. And, and he was asking me the question about like, you know, how do things feel differently in this bull market versus the last bull market, right? Because I've been working on this project since the beginning and been around for a while. And it was kind of funny how we were just, I was just kind of commenting in, in, in reflection that like the, the state of the protocol, the efficiency of it, the structure of it, capabilities of it is so far away better than it was in the last bull market. It's not even fucking comparable. Like it's just with streaming swaps, with savers, with like, this is so many things. We, we, we've done so much innovation in the last few years. It's almost like kind of, un, it almost makes your head spin in some sense. It's all like, it just makes me so bullish about this year because we have so many things all coming together at the same time. I mean, then we didn't even have integrations in, in the in the first bull market. <laughs> now, we didn't, I don't even think we had any integrations like, you know, integration partners other than like Thor Swap and Thor Wallet and that kind of thing, you know, dedicated systems. And and like now we have so many that are like positioned. It's it's quite uh, it's almost comical how how morning how day and night it is between the between the two of those things. So it's it's really exciting to see that this next bull market's going to be absolutely epic. Yeah, I know anyone here that was around in like April 2021 when ChaosNet was was first launched. Like, remember the original like original Thor swap interface and actually like making trades on there. Yeah, you, you had to do it through a through a key store wallet. Even like you couldn't just like you know use your ledger or anything. Like <laughs> the UX has improved so much, and the, and the back end too. Obviously, like the actual protocol itself, it's it's crazy how how different it is like today versus yeah. uh, looking back. Yeah. If someone has some old screenshots from like the the first days, I think I have some. Somewhere, but I can't find them. But I, I, lo I love to, you know, look back in like old screenshots of, uh, of like the way the yeah. protocol, like <laughs> the, the front ends, like used to look like back in the day. And it's like it's like it's like a it's like a computer terminal, you know. It's, it's yeah. like ancient looking. It was so different. I mean, yeah. To think we didn't we didn't have almost most of the things we have today that people value, like and people in our community value, like streaming swaps, like savers, right? Like integrations with Trust Wallet and, and MetaMask and blah, 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 and Shapeshift. Like, none of those things really existed in the last bull market. Almost none of them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And so it's just like the things of most value came from the innovations that we did uh, towards the end of the bull market and, and during the bear market. The things that people are most excited about, people that, that creates the most value for the industry as a whole. So it just, it's kind of like, I hadn't really thought about it until Orion kind of asked me the question before the spaces, but I was like, Oh my God. Yeah. I'm like, we, we were so better off than we were before. It's not even, it's not even, yeah. not even funny. And that's because no one really left because the people who, you know, believe in having like this base layer of this, this base layer of decentralized liquidity that is, you know, it's on its own autonomous system that can just like, that can just operate. Like the, the people that believe in it, like really believe that, like this is the way that just this is good this is the base layer for liquidity uh in, in all of crypto right and we're, we're already seeing like the first centralized exchanges like you know starting to starting to tap door chain for uh you know just rebalancing liquidity and using that and it, it's just i mean it's obvious to me that's i mean that's why i you know stuck around during the bear and why every every other builder here just believes in it so much because they see that you know things are going to have to move to decentralized rails and that's that's the only way that makes sense to have like a, a global permissionless decentralized uh system and especially for something that operates with the same ethos as as bitcoin like if you're if you're a bitcoiner why would you want the the future of bitcoin to be controlled by centralized exchanges it's it's, it's crazy yeah, they kind of do. Some of those maxis do. <laughs> it's kind of a it's a cognitive dissonance, but uh, they they do say shit like that, and it's just like, what? Okay, like prime example here, like the guy that runs Strike, right? Huge Bitcoiner, like uh, you know, he's like you know all about like decentralization, blah blah. Like you you go to use Strike to to buy Bitcoin, you're buying it from your bank account and you sell it and you, you get fiat to your bank account. It's, it's just, it's just an app to buy and sell Bitcoin using his trusted service. You know, you have to, you're, you're trusting that. Yeah. They're going to, they're going to withdraw from your bank account. Then you're going to get your Bitcoin back, you know? And obviously that's the only way to run some kind of a system that runs on fiat is going to need to have some kind of trusted rails there where you need someone that's, that's a, uh, 
intermediary that's going to be taking you know the fiat and then then giving you the bitcoin but like the the entire purpose uh the entire value of bitcoin is being this like decentralized trustless store of value like e -E. so having not having a a trustless base layer of liquidity is like you know the fact that anyone could could be like oh yeah the value of like a uh of a way to exchange it to, to fiat is greater than a value of, of the, the value of a way to exchange it permissionlessly is like kind of a crazy thing to say, I think at least. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, uh, I saw, I think his name is Jack Mahler. I want to say his name is the, the CEO. Yeah, right? yeah. Jack he, Mahler. Yeah. yeah. I saw him speak at, I think it was the Bitcoin conference. Was, and I'm just, I really don't like that guy. I really don't like that guy. I've never seen somebody so cocky over doing so little. <laughs> just, I mean, it's got uh, a cool. It was, app. Like, I, don't I, get me wrong. I like the app, but just like, just as a as a principle, you know, like it, the the fact that you that you, um that you'd want the base layer of Bitcoin to be like, oh yeah, you can exchange it for for dollars. It's like, all right, like, <laughs> what, what's the what's the value in that? <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. I have a hard time taking him seriously in general. I just every time he talks, I'm just like, uh, "Yep, don't care what you don't care what you're saying." <laughs> For sure. I uh, brought up uh, Compound. What's up? Get some other questions here. Yeah, I just wanted to jump on here and say, "Fuck that poly guy and his army of bots." Dude's a scammer. Oh yeah. Thanks, Peter. Hey guys, what's going on? Just uh, came into your space because of Pauly and uh, sitting around listening. Um, sounds like you guys are on the ball. Um, I want to ask you just in relation to what you just spoke about. Um, how do you feel about the introduction and ramping up of privacy protocols with all this stuff, right? So you don't have to worry about you know, if governments, intermediaries being able to intercept, put holds, freezes on what you're doing and, and not even have eyes on what you're doing. Um, you know, the only way to do that now in a way that you wouldn't be able to be tracked would be with cash. Um, do you guys foresee introducing that into your platform or, or what are some of, if you do have some, do you, what are some of the um, protocols that you like that are the most privacy and security minded where you're not going to have to worry about uh, KYC, AML, and other type of issues that uh, can be thorny when it comes to privacy and security. Kyle, you want to take this or want me to take it? You got it. You got it? Okay. Um, for, uh, so I'm a fan of privacy. Like I'm a fan of privacy protocols. Um, we need more of them. We need higher quality ones. Privacy is a very hard thing to accomplish. It's It's... It's easy to it's easy to do something that kind of works, but it's hard to do something that is really you know um, effective. It, it's extremely difficult. I think there probably just needs more innovation to be done in the cryptography world. I think they will. Maybe like fully fully homomorphic uh, encryption will be kind of like the key to really kind of cracking this nut. But I don't feel like we're quite there in general, but we're getting there. Um, privacy is a very kind of hot topic in our community. There are people who are you know, advocates of adding privacy tokens, privacy chains to the network like Monero, like Zcash. Uh, I'm personally a big fan of it. I, I would love to see that happen uh, at some point in the future. Other people are more kind of um, kind of more hesitant. They don't want to invite uh, um, government oversight or government you know inquiry into Thorchain because you know, people are using it to, to launder money through Monero or whatever. Like, I think that's one of the concerns that some people, some people have. Um, but that's just going to be a debate in our community of whether or not we want to add these kind of things. Monero's is very difficult to add. We, we, we spent a lot of time trying to get the, the tech right to add it. And we have it mostly there. We, and we're um, getting closer, but it's just extremely difficult to, to accomplish. Zcash is a lot easier to do in theory. Uh, the, the Monero, but I would love to see us add some privacy tokens or privacy chains uh, to the network. Awesome, thanks, guys. Also important to note that you know Thorchain just as a base layer protocol 
Um, you all, like all, all Thorchain cares about is whether you can send coins to Thorchain and with a memo to swap to anything, right? So you can just like Thor, Thorchain has no concept of anything outside of just what's on chain. So it just it accepts Bitcoin from you know any valid any valid uh, any valid sender, right? As long as it has a as long as it has a memo sent to the right Thorchain vault, it just recognizes that and does the swap. So like Thorchain as a protocol has no concept of like identity or anything anything outside of just like uh, just just value. Um, so that's just an, an important point about the the protocol. It doesn't it doesn't know anything outside of what's on chain. So uh, you know obviously the, the, as a as an interface like interfaces can do whatever they want and like you know obviously that's something that interfaces um you know might need to might need to do something to protect themselves but like as a protocol like thorchain has no ability to uh, you know censor transactions or to to, to do anything yeah, it, so- it sounds like you guys would also be protected like uh analogous to section 230 um allowing the tech companies or the social media companies to have um no liability when it comes to what is being posted on their mediums. So, I mean, from what you explained, it just sounds like you allow interactions um, as long as they're on chain on your protocol and you really have no say whatsoever as far as the content of what is happening or the background of, of the actors that are coming in to use the protocol. Is that correct? Right. I mean, it's like Uniswap. Like anyone could just interact with the contracts. Like the the front end can do whatever it wants, but the actual back end has no concept of anything beyond just you know the interaction with the protocol itself. So, yep. Thanks, man. Uh, Crypto Sailor. Oh, hello, everybody. Thanks for having me on. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you. Uh, great job again on the spaces. Appreciate it as always. Um, I actually came up just to do some transparency. Um, I understand, of course, there's always drama and in, in discussions that are going on. And there are some of us who like the idea of an organized forum for that in terms of some kind of foundation or something or whatever ends up being called. And we are doing some exploratory discussions on this and, um, if people are interested, they can get in touch with me in participating more. But I just want to make people aware because obviously to do this, I would never uh, want to go in any kind of secretive manner in the going about of it. And just as a little background, I um, have been involved in the crypto industry or community since 2011. I helped organize community events like meetups and conferences. Uh, in the original Bitcoin community, I helped uh, organize and form the Bitcoin Association of Canada. And so I've been very much involved in these kinds of endeavors before. And there, uh, I think, a lot of benefits. And so I'm just wanting to make sure that everybody is aware of this. And this is a f- 100% a friendly endeavor uh, looking to support what we see is a lot of tremendous work, a lot of top tier professionalism around development and security and thinking through of the consequences of Thorfi. And it's my own perspective that out of respect for the tremendous amount of wisdom and knowledge experience that the technical team has, that we should respect that. And as well as the the people who are contributing the real value to the network, such as providing liquidity and running nodes, uh, that we should, I think, my own opinion, and I think the opinion of those of us discussing this, is that we should elevate that level of professionalism in terms of business and marketing and communications and things like this out of respect for that. So I just am saying that to, to make sure everybody's aware of this and there's no attempt to disrupt existing development processes. Uh, if you look at generally the groups that do this kind of thing, maybe they're involved a little bit more in development, but I think there's a really quality development group Uh I myself have mentioned before, I, as someone from the engineering side of things, I don't disagree with 99% of what the development team has done. I think they always do a good job, especially in responding to security issues. So that's kind of why I came up. And I don't mean to you know, disrupt your conversation, but again, out of you know, an abundance of appreciation for uh, the, the team developing and of transparency, I just wanted to let everybody on the call know that. Uh, and 
I'm not sure if there's any other questions or whatever. I don't mean to disrupt your, your, your call, as I said. So thanks very much. Thanks, Taylor. Appreciate the, uh, the, the transparency and the comment. Appreciate that. Cool. What else do you want to talk about, Chad? Anything, anything else or uh, should we wrap it up? Um, well, we got a pretty decent audience still here, 300 people. So people are still interested in chatting. Anybody who wants to come up and ask a question or engage or has a welcome to, um, I'm trying to think of anything else we want to talk to that's like more recent. Um, did you want oh, so to, I talk a bit about, there were some recent issues that people, I mean, there is like an article that was published about some rift in the community and stuff like that. I don't know if you've gone much into that in a public space or I missed it on this call. Uh, just interested in your thoughts or whether or not it's appropriate. Um, I mean, I, I think that like, I think that the, the conversation is going to require a long-term conversation, right? I, it's not something we're going to settle like today or even this month or whatever. There's just going to be an ongoing conversation in the community about us deciding what, what do we want, what we want to see for, how we want to move forward, right? And in the end, we're going to have, you know, step-by-step -step processes of talking about ADRs, like ADR 012 is one that's going to be voting on, I think, uh, tomorrow, I think. I think the voting starts, if I'm not mistaken. Um, in, in voting on on each thing, so I think it's probably best that we that when we talk about these kind of things, that we, we can have kind of high level conversations if you want to, and that's and that's fine. But it's it's more helpful to to talk about kind of individual kind of proposals. So ADR zero twelve is, is the next one, and then is the one that we're going to be voting on. You know, um, I think tomorrow or early next week, and that'll be kind of a, a topic of conversation that we could kind of get into more details about. Yeah, so voting for that's probably going to open up pretty soon. I mean, I guess we could just talk about this for like one last thing, just like what the ADR is and uh, like what it means. So it's basically the ADR to scale the, the lending protocol. So um, as part of the scaling of the lending protocol, like basically what this is a vote for is um, is a couple of things. First is to set the maximum collateralization ratio of lending. So, you know, take out, take out a loan against your native Bitcoin. What's your collateralization ratio? Uh, it'd be 200% or 50% LTV, which is probably simpler terms for people to think about. And the other thing would be to be the, to burn the standby reserve. So there's a, there's a standby reserve, which has never been deployed and set aside since the beginning of the protocol. And this proposal would set the LTV to 50%, uh, always. So you'd always get a 50% LTV loan as long as, uh, we're not at the lending caps and it would burn the entire standby reserve. And by burning the standby reserve, it opens up space for lending because of the lending lever. And the, so the lending lever is a mechanic that um, basically allows for um, you know, some, some margin of safety. So that way, um, uh, with, with the mechanics of lending, that if the room price decreases, even, even a lot um, in comparison to Bitcoin or Ethereum, then there's no mint there's no net mint of, of rune from the maximum supply, uh, even if it decreases a lot. So essentially what this does is it opens up, I think somewhere around like 15 million, uh, 15 million rune of space in the lending protocol. So that scales uh, up 20. lending, uh, 20 million rune. So that scales it up to what, like 50, uh, $50 million or something like that into the lending protocol. So it would yeah, essentially it, allow yeah, lending to start really ripping. It'd be 25 million room for, for open for loan, which means in total, in total, that would be you know, whatever the price of rune is times that. So it's a lot of money. It's 125 million, 130 million. Uh, that, that includes the loans that are already currently open, of course. But let me let me kind of talk about it a, a little bit differently. The, the cow kind of gave a good like kind of technical explanation, but let's kind of like give more context to it. So the lending that we, that we have on ThorChain is very different. It's structurally very different than every other lending, lending protocol that you've ever heard about before. It's very experimental and it's very novel. And it allows us to do things that nobody else can do, right? It allows us to have a better loan um, offer than anybody else can do in, in, in the industry. And the, when we first launched it, we wanted to keep it small. So we only launched it with a 5 million cap, which is like, I think like 1% or something like this, 1% of the, the total supply of room. 
And so it's, it's, it was launched in a very, very small way just to make sure there was no bugs, no exploits, you know, keep it small, keep it tight, um, slow launch, you know, ramp it up over time. But that first kind of launch, we wanted to just kind of see what the market behavior was with a small little tiny cap, make sure there's no bugs or problems, whatever. And we've gotten through that. And thus far, we've seen nothing but really, you know, green flags, right? The number of loans that open and closed uh, in the network is very small, much smaller than I would have thought. Right. I think it's like around 700 loans are currently open and a total of like 50 loans or something like this have been closed. And out of the loans that have been closed, almost every single one of them has been closed when the collateral asset is up in value, which is positive for the protocol. So thus far, it's been really positive and we've seen a lot of green flags, but it's also very early, too. Right, you can't look at that and say, "Hey, everything's great." You know, YOLO, let's go. No, I don't. I don't. Th I think that would be um, um, uh, irresponsible. So the next part, at least in my view, is now that we've confirmed that the basically the code works and basically the lending uh, has been very effective, at least in that small amount. I want to see it kind of scale up to about five x where it is now, which is what we're, t we're talking about, and see how the l lending happens and with the larger data set of collection of information, right? Over a longer period of time, right? We've only been lending for, I think we launched it in August or something like this. So it's been, you know, about six months, a little over six months. And I wanted to kind of give it more time just so we can collect more data about how users interact with this system, right? Um, what is the behavior that they have in up markets? What are the behavior they have in down markets? What are the behavior of, like in all the cases and scenarios so that we can understand uh, alone with this kind of, attributes along with this kind of deal um, how does the real world respond to it and and part of that i think which is one of the reasons i wanted to go down to 200 percent uh, cr or a 50 percent ltv which is a much better deal for for the for the borrower which is great because we kind of like sat around like 85 90 for like a, for like months because as we as you get higher in utilization of the cap the LTV drops, 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 and it gets less and less enticing, you know, as a, as a borrower. And so we kind of like saw this kind of balance be struck around 80%, 90%. So I want to see if we put it at 200% and hard, lock it at that, it's a much better deal for the, for the, for the community, for the, for the borrower. It's actually a much safer deal for the, for the protocol. It's actually safer, less, less likely to have any issues. Um, and the amount of value that we extract from those loans can be the same as, as what it is now if we if the demand is there if the lower uh, if the highest LTV constitutes more demand which I think it naturally would uh, we would see a lot of value come into the protocol which is really good so if, uh, what I'm looking to see happen if this gets passed if people vote for it and it passes um, what I'm looking to see happen is I want to see another six months of behavior I want to see you know Probably, I'm, I'm guessing 5x or maybe maybe actually probably more than 5x because we're going to a 50% LTV, so it would allow for more loans to be opened. So probably more than 5x number of loans to be opened, and, and, we'll, and we can continue to see the behavior of those people and what they do. And then we'll see how fast the caps get hit. When we lock it at 50% LTV rather than 50% and then it goes down to uh, 20%, how how fast do people dive on this thing and and does it happen in, in you know a month or three months or six months like what is it you know that um, that's what i'm fascinated to, to, to learn more about the other thing that i'm curious to do not today or this week but relating to s the same area is actually dropping the ltv uh raising the ltv again uh instead of going to 50 percent going to 67 percent. and the reason why i want to do that is because once again you create a better deal for for, for the for the borrowers you make it a safer for the protocol, uh, and you create a loan that I don't think exists within DeFi. Like I don't think you can get a sixty-seven percent LTV on any loan within DeFi. At least not that I'm aware. If anybody else knows about one, you know, let me know or whatever. But I'm pretty sure I've never heard of it. And you might see uh, what I'm what I would hope to see is kind of like a vampire attack, right? We saw a good example of a vampire attack was when we saw that when Sushi first launched back in twenty. Uh, what was that? 2018, I think it was. I want to say 2017, 2018. And where Sushi launched, and they had this new token called Sushi, and you could mine it through liquidity and mining, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of the capital, a lot of the LTV that was in Uniswap exited 
and they almost like there's they lost like 80 percent something crazy like that of their ltv and it all just flooded into sushi like literally in like in a week it was like in a few days even it was kind of crazy to watch now i'm not saying that's what's going to happen to thorchan i'm not trying to make predictions of that or anything like that i'm just saying that's an example of what a, a vampire attack looks like so when you have a, a lending system right that can offer a much better deal than what any other lending protocol can do not what they do do today but what they can do they can't safely do a 67 percent ltv it just wouldn't make sense it's too risky for the borrower to do that in our case it's not because our design is so different and so what happens when you have a situation when you have a lending protocol that is remarkably different than everybody else and therefore can provide a better deal than anything else can do is there going to be a mass exodus from ave compound you know whatever 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 into the Thor chain system because it's just better. You six percent LTV, you get zero percent interest locked in at that, and you get um, uh, no liquidations and you get no expir expiration of your loan. I mean, that's pretty fucking awesome. I mean, like you cannot look me with a straight eye and tell me that isn't ridiculously um, amazing, right? And in the lending market in general is absolutely massive. It's 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 bigger than than the AMM market, in fact, right? When we have an opportunity to do that. In a really big way, and and do it not just for the East people, which is what most of lending is today, the vast majority of it is, but do it for the entire industry, including Layer One Bitcoin. And that's fucking, I don't know. That, that to me, I'm just blown away by that. I think that's just so innovative and so different, and such a better value for the industry that I'm. Just, it gets me really interested and really excited about it. So I'm, I'm I want to do this twenty percent, sorry, two hundred percent CR, a, a, aka fifty percent LTV. In the meantime, it's kind of a stepping stone. But I'm interested maybe in another few months, six months, whatever it's going to be, to, to raise that LTV up to 67% and then see how the market reacts. Because I think it might be fairly strong. Yeah, man, great explanation. Um, and so so this ADR is just to just to raise the LT or lower, you know, it's to change the LTV to 50%, essentially. So uh, that's what the vote's on. Great explanation on what the lending protocol is, and uh, it seems like the like the devs are um, pretty unanimously in favor. There's definitely some people that are, you know, there's people that are just against the lending protocol in the first place, which is also fair criticism. But it, uh, I haven't seen any explicit feedback from the node operators saying that they would disagree with this change. So, uh, like right now, it's definitely looking like there's there's interest for this. I know like Pluto has. Um, you know, said he's in, in favor, like I, I would, I would be in favor of, you know, ADR 12. So not, not that I have a vote, but <laughs> you know, I guess the, the, the nodes are the ones that vote on the ADRs. So um, I haven't seen any nodes that have explicitly said that they wouldn't vote for it, but um, only way to find out is by doing the vote. So we'll see what happens uh, next week, probably. Yeah. It's going to be exciting. That's going to be really exciting just to watch how that unfurls. It's like it's approved and happens, which hopefully it will. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm going to be excited just to watch it. So much data to collect. Orion, get your data ready. Get some data analysis. Crunch those numbers. It's going right, to be fun All the flip side watch. nerds, they're, uh, they're ready. Yeah. We need to get, we need to get um, uh, Wiggum and, and Orion to start pumping out some you – know, and the other guy, what's his name? Um, Dan – not Dan. Uh, Kellen? Uh, okay, there's some guy who was a name – like his name was like twice or three times. Dan, uh, Bam Bam? Yeah, that's it. Bam, bam. Get that guy too, because they they create they do a lot of good work and they produce really good charts, and it'll be really fascinating to see how the market reacts to it. Could I make a quick comment? I I think it's important in an open source project for dissent to be heard as well, and I understand that people in this space, like yourself, uh, Chad, and the Thorchain account, are positive to this. I'd like to hear from the other side who are negative as well. I think that's important to make sure that there's representation of the different perspectives on a forum like this. And the other thing I would say is, Chad, you've mentioned this before, but uh, you know, burning or whatever this is, it's not reducing supply. It's not a tokenomics, you know, degenerative, want to be central banking thing where you're trying to control supply to manipulate economic outcomes. It is being used to underwrite the lending, correct? Um. Uh, how would I phrase this? I mean, it's it's burning the sixty million standby room is is meant to give space, right? So it's like 
we could like, let me put it this way we could just raise the cap without burning anything and just like have it and just allow people to open loans you know somewhat arbitrarily like there's nothing stopping us from doing that right but because lending is like, because it's design is so new and the idea that's so novel and 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 it's 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 assumptions need to be tested in the market you can't test it you know in a in an excel sheet you need the real market you need the real people you need real money uh and then, so in order to do that in a way that's as safe as possible for the protocol we we try to utilize you know um uh some room that we've that we've allocated for some some purpose and just reallocated for this purpose just to, to to give protection to the network so that worst case scenario is um you know lending goes bad for some whatever the hell the reason is and 100 percent of the loans close which that never actually happens even when the lending protocol collapses uh you know only half the loans are closed like that was pretty much true with anchor that's true with like block when they became insolvent like Really, you only get like the worst case scenario is like half the loans to close. But let's just imagine the worst case scenario and say it's 100%. You want to make sure that like that, that in our case, it wouldn't actually cause an inflation of the Rune token, right? Rune is always, always going to be 500 million. That's just that's the hard cap. It's not going to mint 510 million or something like this. It, it's designed to do that. Now, in order to do that, to maintain the 500 million cap and that you know, everybody, including myself, wants to maintain, um, you have to get that capital from, from somewhere, you know, in order to, to to kind of try out this idea, right? And so initially you use the 15 million rune that's missing from supply due to people who didn't uh, upgrade their rune from BEP2 to rune to a, to native rune. That was like the kind of, we kind of borrowed from that scenario, basically, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a free thing to borrow from. And then, you know, we use that up. We're now at, uh, I think like 80 something, 82%, whatever it is of that cap of that first 15 million. And now we got this 60 million that we're looking to use. And then we're asking the community if it's okay to use the 60 million for this particular purpose, which we're gonna be voting on over the course of the next week, right? And after that point, we can just decide about like how we want, if we want to further scale it, you know, how do we wanna do it after that point? And there's a lot of different ways to think about it. We can say, uh, we're gonna change the lend lending lever to be instead of one third of the missing rune, uh, we'll do one half, right? And that'll create more space. Or we could say, um, all right, we're going to do it differently. Um, we're going to allow, be it relative to the pools, right? We're not going to allow loans to be open that are greater than the pool value itself. I don't know. This, you can kind of change the way you think about the caps in that in that sense as well. So it's all it's all very different. But I, I think one thing I want people to understand is that when we say burning sixty million from the standby reserve. I think people get confused and, and they think that we're going to reduce the supply by 60 million, which is not technically accurate because the room that's in the reserve standby or active, is not part of circulating supply, right? So the circulating supply of room is going to be stay the same. So while people may, you know, who are confused might buy room to cause the room, the room price to pump in that sense, that's not what this is about. We're not trying to get the room price to pump because we're burning 60 million. That's just, that's just misconception from people who, who may be falling into that. We're purely just taking rune that's out of supply and we're removing it from the, the total supply. And theoretically that supply could get minted back just because loan lending goes terribly, something happens, blah, 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 whatever happens. And, and all that 60 million rune that we burnt gets minted back and, you know, and we're back to where we started kind of more or less, right? So I want to be clear about that. And I don't want to, I don't want to misconstrue things. I want to make sure people understand the implications of it. Does that help, CryptoSailor? Yeah, absolutely. And I, as you say, it is just confusion. And I think one really important thing about ThorChain is to make sure it's distinguished from all the garbage crypto that's out there. I think some of us who are naturally attracted to quality projects and want to see this technology evolve in a positive way uh, don't pay attention to that. So it seems like there's a lot of good stuff going on in crypto, but from the outside looking in, it's mostly uh, quite cringy. I don't know how <laughs> a more <laughs> a different word to use, but so I think that's maybe even just the word burn is a better, if a better term was used, maybe that would help to alleviate confusion. Yeah. Um... That is the actual technically correct term because what's actually going to happen is we're going to make a code change and do a KV store migration, in which case 
we will take 60 million rune from the standby wallet and then just call the burn module and burn it. But if there's a better term that you think would be more clear or better, then let me know. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it all, guys. Cool. I'd say uh, let's call it here. Thanks for everyone for, for coming out. And uh, yeah, again, we'll be in East Denver if you guys are going to be there. Uh, we're, we'll meet up on the 2nd of March. We're going to do a happy hour with Coinage and uh, Zach Guzman and, and their team. And uh, yeah, sounds good, guys. Yep. First person to arrive at the event uh, at East Denver gets to cuddle with the familiar cow. So see you guys there. <laughs> nope. <laughs> what cow you don't want to cuddle come on you're the cuddle cow come on i i don't even have words i'm just volunteering you for a cuddle don't worry about it don't, it's fine it's fine don't worry about it <laughs> okay yeah we'll, we'll talk we'll talk all right see you guys all right bro see you guys